Chapter 2 Life in Christ What God gives you when you are saved First, we should note that, as far as God is concerned, the only things that are real are those of the spirit realm, because they are the only things that last forever. This understanding comes from 2 Corinthians 4 verse 18, which says that the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Jesus said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away, Matthew 24 verse 35. That is why Hebrews 11 verses 1 to 3 says that faith is, the evidence of things not seen. It also says that, things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. In other words, by faith, the things of the spirit realm appear to us, while the things we see in the physical realm are not real, because they are only temporal or temporary. Because God created all things by Jesus Christ, Ephesians 3 verse 9, and every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, James 1 verse 17, hmm, didn't we learn something about Jesus being the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world, John 1 verse 9, God has an unlimited supply of good things. Since he loves us, he wants to give us those good things. Paul even says, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Romans 8 verse 32 Now, you may say, why doesn't he give everyone these things? The reason is because most people are not mature enough to handle good things. For example, the richest man in the world would not give all his wealth to his one-year-old child because he would not use it wisely. However, once that child becomes an adult and has the maturity to use his wealth wisely, he may be willing to give his wealth to his child. Similarly, before we were saved, we were children, spiritually speaking, Galatians 4 verse 3. However, once we believed the gospel, we became spiritual adults, such that God adopted us as sons and gave us an inheritance, Galatians 4 verses 5 to 7. In other words, learning the lesson of the conscience so that we have faith in Christ gives us the spiritual maturity for God to treat us like adults. Therefore, he hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, Ephesians 1 verse 3. This. Verse does not say that God will bless us with some spiritual blessings, but it says that he has already blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Therefore, when we believe the gospel, we undergo a huge spiritual status change. Because all of our blessings from God are spiritual, we look exactly the same in the flesh after we are saved as we did before we were saved. We also do not receive material blessings from God, such as a high-paying job or a new car. Therefore, we have to go to God's word to find out what our spiritual blessings are. As mentioned previously, the only portion of scripture written to us today is Paul's epistles. Therefore, we must go to Romans through Philemon to find out what these blessings are. God gave us the gift of eternal life, Romans 6 verse 23, by forgiving us of all our trespasses, Colossians 2 verse 13, not just some, but all. The way this was accomplished was that the Holy Spirit spiritually baptized us into, identified us with, the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13. This means that, whatever happened to Christ, also happened to us. Since he went to the grave, we went to the grave. Since he was resurrected to new life, we are resurrected to new life, Romans 6 verses 3 to 5. Thus, our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, Romans 6 verse 6. In other words, we were spiritually circumcised. This happened through the faith of the operation of God, Colossians 2 verses 11 to 12. In other words, before we were saved, we had a conscience and tried to follow it. However, our spirit was dead, which means that we could only use the flesh to try to obey the conscience and our dead spirit had to go along with whatever the flesh decided to do. Since no good thing dwells in our flesh, all we did was sin. Once we believed the gospel, we had learned the lesson of the conscience. Since we learned this lesson, the conscience is of no more use to us. Therefore, God performed a spiritual operation on us, whereby he cut off or circumcised the automatic link between our sin nature and our conscience. He then took our dead spirits and quickened them or made them alive, Ephesians 2 verse 1. All of this was done when the Spirit placed us into Christ.
Before you were saved, your spirit was dead, your body was alive, and you had the law in your conscience. Your sin nature worked with the law of your conscience and used the power of your body to sin. The strength of sin is the law, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 56. The result was that you only did dead works, Hebrews 9 verse 14. Therefore, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, Romans 7 verse 18. This is shown graphically as follows. Before Christ, 000. Body alive. Conscience. C. Sin. Once you were saved, God spiritually baptized you into Christ, so that ye are dead, your body, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Colossians 3 verse 3. This is shown graphically as follows. Spirit alive. Sin. In Christ. Sin nature. 11. Conscience. C. Link between sin nature and link between spirit. Conscience broken by and soul established circumcision by the faith of Christ. Note that your sin nature and your conscience are still with you, but you also have an alive spirit that can operate by the faith of Christ. This means that you now have a choice. You can, one, choose to operate as Adam by re-establishing the link between the sin nature and your body, which is shown graphically as follows. Body pretend. It's alive. Flesh is behavior. Fantasy world. L. Or. 2. Let Christ live in you, which is shown graphically as follows. Life. Of. Cree. St. Christ's behavior in you. Right to. SNES. Sin. Nature. Conscience. C. The problem is that, because your flesh lusts after the spirit, Galatians 5 verse 17, and churchianity predominantly operates in the flesh because they want money and power, most Christians think that, when they are saved, God enables them to operate their bodies to live for Christ, rather than enabling the Holy Ghost to teach them the things of God so that they use the mind of Christ so that Christ lives in you. 1 Corinthians 2 verses 9 to 16. In other words, both their flesh and churchianity keep them from reading and believing what God has to say about their new condition, and so they think the following is true. However, it is not true, which is why it does not work. Churchianity's False Teaching Right to SNES X Soul Alive Sin Nature, Conscience, and Body Used as Before Body alive and better than. Spirit alive. Changed sin nature. Hyteen. Conscient. D. E. Alive spirit ignored. Life in Christ. Now, we will look at God's design for you to live your life after you are saved. Because God's changes in you are only spiritual, we will only learn about these things by reading the Bible, specifically Paul's epistles, since this is the only part of the Bible written to us today. Therefore, everything will be backed up by scripture. Man's viewpoint will not be added. Death and Adam. The first thing to understand is that, before you are saved, you live according to the mechanisms in Adam once he sinned. As already established, when Adam sinned, the sin nature came into him. By one man sin entered into the world. Romans 5 verse 12. Romans 2 verse 14 describes this as the sin nature by saying that the Gentiles do by nature the things contained in the law. Adam also received a conscience to know good and evil. The eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. Genesis 3 verse 7. Dot. Both the sin nature and the conscience are passed on to you through your father's seed, which is Adam's seed. This is seen in Romans 5 verse 12, which says, By one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Thus, by one man's offense death reigned by one. Romans. 517. Therefore, all people born, because they have an earthly father, are born into Adam, and in Adam all die. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 22. Christ's virgin birth. Other than Adam, there was one more man who was born without an earthly father. That man is Jesus Christ. Therefore, the sin nature was not passed on to him. 
You may say, but, Christ was born of an earthly mother, and Eve sinned, just like Adam did. Therefore, the sin nature was passed on to Jesus, as well. However, scripture says otherwise. First, note that the commandment not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was given to Adam before Eve was created, since the commandment was given in Genesis 2 verses 16 to 17 and Eve was created in Genesis 2 verses 21 to 22. Because of this, Adam's sin was intentional, while Eve's sin was unintentional. Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. 1 Timothy 2 verses 13 to 14. Since sin is not imputed when there is no law, Romans 5 verse 13, Eve's sin was not imputed to her account. This means that only Adam was responsible for this initial sin. Therefore, God promised that he would redeem Adam or man through Eve's seed, Genesis 3 verse 15. This means that, when Jesus was born of a virgin, Matthew 1 verses 20 to 25, he did not have the sin nature. This means that, like Adam, he could choose to sin or not. Unlike Adam, Jesus chose not to sin. Jesus Christ was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin, Hebrews 4 verse 15. Since Jesus did no sin, 1 Peter 2 verse 22, he had not earned death, like all other people have, Romans 6 verse 23. Therefore, he could be a propitiation for our sin, Romans 3 verse 25. In other words, he was made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. Simply stated, this means that, when you believe the gospel, Christ's death counts for your death. You are baptized into Jesus Christ's death, Romans 6 verse 3. Baptized does not mean water, but it means identified with. As proof, look at 1 Corinthians 10 verse 2 which says that the Hebrews were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. This was a dry baptism, since Pharaoh's army drowned in the sea, while Israel walked across the sea on dry land. Thus, your baptism in Jesus Christ's death simply means that you are identified with his death, meaning that his death pays for your sins. This baptism into Christ's body is done by the Spirit, according to 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13. Note, from that verse, that all of the Corinthians were baptized into Christ's body by the Spirit, even though 1 Corinthians 1 verses 14 to 17 says that most of the Corinthians were not water baptized. According to Ephesians 4 verse 5, God only recognizes one baptism today. Therefore, this baptism must be the dry baptism by the Spirit into Christ's death. It is not water baptism. Understanding this dry baptism is vital, since you are not in Christ otherwise. Colossians 2 verses 12 to 13 says that we are buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, having forgiven you all trespasses. In other words, if I have not been baptized into Christ's death, then God has not forgiven me of my sins, he has not applied Christ's blood to my soul. If you insist on saying that this baptism is into water, as fundamental churchianity claims, then water baptism must be required for salvation. Yet, Paul says, I thank God that I baptized none of you, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, 1 Corinthians 1 verses 14 and 17. Paul just said that water baptism is not part of the gospel, and he thanks God that he did not baptize them. Therefore, if water baptism is how we are baptized into Christ, then Paul just thanked God that some of the Corinthians do not have forgiveness of sins. Certainly, this is not the case. Therefore, our dry baptism into Christ's death is how our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, Romans 6 verse 6. But, because churchianity is focused on water baptism, they do not recognize that we are in Christ. Being in Christ means that ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God, Colossians 3 verse 3. In other words, you are not a changed person, as churchianity claims, but you are a completely different person. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17. This is a good thing, too, because in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made. Alive, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 22. In Adam, you are condemned, in Christ, you are justified, Romans 5 verse 16. 
In Adam, death reigns. In Christ, righteousness reigns in life. Romans 5 verse 17. In Adam, you are a sinner. In Christ, you are righteous. Romans 5 verse 19. Therefore, there must be an identity change when you are saved. If churchianity is right that, after I am saved, all God does is make me a better person, then Christ is dead in vain. Galatians 2 verse 21. For example, let's say that I was an alcoholic and an adulterer before I was saved. Then, God saved me, made me a better person, and I stopped doing those things. While my changed behavior is helpful to society, I still sin. Jesus said that you sin, not when you do the sin, but when you think about doing the sin, whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Matthew 5 verse 28. Dot. Furthermore, James 2 verse 10 says, Whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Therefore, if I even think about telling a lie, I am as guilty before God as if I were a serial killer. Therefore, while turning from the really bad sins is great for society, doing so does not change my standing before God. Churches that claim eternal security is true would say that I was never saved in the first place if I were to become a serial killer after I was supposedly saved. Yet, as far as God is concerned, all of us still live lives, after we are saved, that are just as bad as that serial killer, because we all sin in some capacity after we are saved. Therefore, God did not just forgive my sins when I was saved, but he had to place me into Christ so my future sins would not be counted against me. I had to have an identity change from being in Adam and headed for hell to being in Christ and headed for heaven. David and Saul Perhaps an example will make this easier to understand. The Lord chose Saul to reign over Israel, 1 Samuel 9 verse 17. After two years, 1 Samuel 13 verse 1, God told Saul to wait for Samuel to arrive before doing anything, 1 Samuel 13 verse 8. Instead, Saul took it upon himself to sacrifice to the Lord before Samuel got there, 1 Samuel 13 verse 9. Because Saul disobeyed the Lord, God took the kingdom away from Saul, 1 Samuel 13 verses 11 to 14. God replaced Saul with David. David committed adultery with Bathsheba, 2 Samuel 11 verses 3 to 4. Then, so that his sin would not be found out, David murdered Bathsheba's husband, 2 Samuel 11 verses 14 to 17. Yet, David remains as God's king because the Lord would not impute sin to his account, Romans 4 verses 6 to 8. So, Saul offers a sacrifice to the Lord, and God took the kingdom away from him. David committed adultery and murder, and God did not hold it against him. Why? Because David believed God, and Saul did not believe God. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please God. It does not say, without avoiding the really big sins, it is impossible to please God. Therefore, when you believe the gospel that God has given you, you have pleased God. Period. That is all he can really ask from you, due to your sin nature, dead to the law. That is why Galatians 2 verse 19 says, For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. Ye are not under the law, but under grace. Romans 6 verse 14. If God kept us under the law after we were saved, the sin nature would work with our conscience to become exceeding sinful. Romans 7 verses 12 to 13. That is why only dead works are produced by trying to serve the Lord, by trying to obey your conscience. Hebrews 9 verse 14. The only way to break free of this deadly cycle is by faith. That is why the definition of sin is not missing the mark, as the theologians say, or not disobeying God's law, as common folks say. The definition of sin is having no faith, Romans 14 verse 23, the faith of Christ. Therefore, the power to rise above sin is the faith of Christ, not your flesh or a heightened conscience. Christ's faith is mentioned at least seven times in Paul's epistles, Romans 3 verse 22, Galatians 2 verse 16, twice, 2 20, 3 22, Ephesians 3 verse 12, and Philippians 3 verse 9. You will only see this in a King James Bible. Again, churchianity does not want you to understand your life in Christ. Therefore, Christ's faith is completely removed from all other translations by changing faith of Christ to faith I in Christ.
We must recognize that Christ's faith is the power by which Christ lives in us. Without this power, we will try to use our flesh to serve God, which does not work since no good thing dwells in our flesh. Romans 7 verse 18. Note Galatians 2 verse 16, which says, We have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. This shows that we are not even justified by our own faith. We believe the gospel, then the faith of Jesus Christ justifies us, because God has placed us into Christ. Because we are now in Christ, our old man is dead. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me, and gave himself for me. Galatians 2 verse 20. This is why we need the faith of Christ, rather than faith I in Christ. First, God crucifies our old flesh with Christ by placing us into Christ's death by a spirit baptism. Then, we can yield ourselves unto God as those alive from the dead by yielding the members of our flesh as instruments of righteousness unto God. Romans 6 verse 13. The way we do this is by having Christ live in us by operating in the faith of the Son of God. Thus, not only are we justified by the faith of Christ, but we are also supposed to have Christ live in us, not by our faith, but by his faith. How does this work, practically speaking? Well, Ephesians 3 verses 9 to 12 says that we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of Christ into the fellowship of the mystery that was hidden the manifold wisdom of God. In other words, the faith of Christ gives us access to mystery doctrine, which is only found in Paul's epistles. This mystery doctrine is called the unsearchable riches of Christ, Ephesians 3, 3, 7-8. Why is it unsearchable? Because we only have access to this mystery doctrine by the faith of Christ. A man cannot search and find these truths on his own. This is why Colossians 1 verse 27 says that the riches of the glory of this mystery are Christ in you, the hope of glory. And, Colossians 2 verses 2 to 3 goes on to say that all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hid in Christ. In other words, spiritual treasures are sound doctrine, not material possessions. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in High Places, Ephesians 6 verse 12 Therefore, we do not war after the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. 2 Corinthians 10 verses 3 to 4. The offensive weapon of this battle is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Ephesians 6 verse 17. God only gives these weapons to those who are on his side of the battle, which, today, is the body of Christ. That is why it is the glory of God to conceal a thing. Proverbs 25 verse 2 and God rewards believers, who diligently seek Him, Hebrews 11 verse 6, with the treasures of wisdom and knowledge that are hid in Christ, so that we can effectively battle Satan's forces in the spiritual realm. What is faith? We understand how the faith of Christ works only when we understand what faith is. Most people think that faith is belief, and that is not true. I can believe the Bible is true, memorize scripture, and learn things contained in the Bible without having faith. You can think of belief as theory, and faith as the application of that theory. For example, I took accounting courses in college. I learned that an asset is increased with a debit, and a liability is increased with a credit. I believed that to be true, but it was all theory at the time. Now that I have been working in accounting for many years, I have faith that the system is accurate. That is because I have had practical experience that proves that what I learned is true. When it comes to spiritual things, whatsoever is not of faith is sin, Romans 14 verse 23. Since in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, Romans 7 verse 18, I have no faith until I believe the gospel. Therefore, before I am saved, all I can do is sin. Even after I believe the gospel, I do not have any faith on my own, but I have Christ's faith. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. Galatians 2 verse 16. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10 verse 17. So, I hear and believe the gospel, and then Christ's faith is given to me. Christ's faith is the practical application of belief. 
Christ did not have a sin nature, and so he could study scripture every day, and God could teach it to him, Isaiah 50 verses 4 to 5. Christ believed the scripture, and then he lived it out such that he did no sin, 1 Peter 2 verse 22. Since he did no sin, and sin is the opposite of faith, Romans 14 verse 23, he must have done everything by faith. Christ even said, I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things, John 8 verse 28. Since Christ could do nothing of himself, I certainly cannot serve God in my flesh. Since my flesh only sins, I cannot even pick up the Bible, believe it, and obey it. I have to believe the gospel first. I am then placed into Christ, Romans 6 verse 3, and I am given his faith. I can then choose to live by the faith of the Son of God, Galatians 2 verse 20. It is crucial that we understand that faith is not mere belief. There are many people who know Bible stories, have memorized scripture, and believe the Bible to be true, but they cannot obey God, because they have no faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11 verse 1. Just because I believe there is a Loch Ness monster, does not mean that there is one. My belief is no evidence of there being a Loch Ness monster. However, if I believe the gospel and receive the faith of Christ, his faith is the substance and evidence of the things of God. Why? Because Christ lived out his belief in God's word when we cannot in our flesh. He proved that God's word works because he conquered death, was raised from the dead, and has eternal life. Therefore, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection are the evidence that the spiritual things of God do exist. Therefore, faith is substance, while mere belief is not. Therefore, faith is not like a kid who really, really believes that Santa Claus exists. Rather, faith is belief that has been tried and found to be true. Since we cannot, in our flesh, try out our belief in God's word, Christ has to give us his faith and work that faith through our lives. Christ's faith was definitely tried, as he sweat great drops of blood, Luke 22 verse 44, and then humbled himself and became obedient to the death of the cross, Philippians 2 verse 8. However, since we still have vile flesh, Philippians 3 verse 21, Christ's faith does not work through us automatically, even though it is in us. We have to choose to allow Christ's faith to work through us. Also, Christ's faith cannot work when we do not know sound doctrine, because faith is based upon belief, and we do not believe, as long as we are ignorant. Therefore, when we are saved, we are also given the Holy Ghost to teach us the things of God so that we may believe and then allow Christ's faith to work through that belief, 1 Corinthians 2 verses 9 to 16. The Holy Ghost the wisdom of God in a mystery, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 7, was hidden from Satan and his forces, such that they had Christ crucified on a cross, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 8, which resulted in their defeat, Colossians 2 verse 15, by the faith of Christ. Now that the mystery doctrine has been revealed in Paul's epistles, only believers can mine the treasures of the mystery in order to win battles in spiritual places. That is because the natural man receiveth, not the things of the Spirit of God, because they are spiritually discerned, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 14. Therefore, when we use sound doctrine in these battles, we always win, because the weapon of sound doctrine is not understood by unbelievers, nor by Satan and his forces, due to their unbelief, and there is nothing they can do against the truth, 2 Corinthians 13 verse 8. Summary of what God does for us. So, what God does when we believe the gospel is he gives us the faith of Christ, Romans 10 verse 17, so that we might be justified, Galatians 2 verse 16. This involves the Spirit's dry baptism of us into Christ's death, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13, Romans 6 verses 3 to 4, so that Christ's death is counted for us, Romans 3 verse 25, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21, so that God forgives us of all our trespasses, Colossians 2 verse 13. We are now accepted in the Beloved, Ephesians 1 verse 6, who is Jesus Christ, Matthew 3 verses 16 to 17. God also seals us with that Holy Spirit of promise until we are redeemed by Christ at the rapture, Ephesians 1 verses 13 to 14. Therefore, the Holy Ghost is given unto us, Romans 5 verse 5, and ye are dead, 
and your life is hid with Christ in God, Colossians 3 verse 3. This means that Christ is our life, Colossians 3 verse 4, which means that we now have the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 16, which is to always have faith in what the Father tells him, John 8 verses 28 and 38, 10 colon 18, 37 dash 38, 15 colon 10 15. Note that Jesus doing what the Father tells him to do is recorded in John, which is the book about Jesus that shows him as God. That is why Galatians 2 verse 20 says that we live by the faith of the Son of God. Therefore, the mind of Christ is the faith of Christ. This also means that God has quickened us, or made our souls and spirits alive with Christ, Ephesians 2 verse 5. See the appendix for a list of 40 things that we have in Christ. All of this means that we are now equipped to discern the mystery doctrine of God to be used against Satan and his forces in the spiritual realm. Therefore, the Spirit searcheth the deep things of God and teaches them to our spirit as we read and believe the sound doctrine of God's word, 1 Corinthians 2 verses 9 to 13. We can discern these things because our spirits are alive and we have the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2 verses 14 and 16. All of this is by the faith of Christ. Without the faith of Christ, we have no salvation, because there is no faith to please God, Hebrews 11 verse 6, and whatsoever is not of faith is sin, Romans 14 verse 23. Without Christ's faith, then, we have sin on our lives, and God's holiness would be marred by dwelling with us. Therefore, we would have no salvation, no indwelling Holy Ghost, and no Spirit of Christ, and we would still be dead in our sins without the faith of Christ. Therefore, the power for service is the faith of Christ as Christ lives in us as we yield our bodies as living sacrifices, Romans 12 verse 1, for God to use. The power is not our flesh. If we decide to try to serve God in the energies of our flesh, we are not using the faith of Christ. Instead, we are using the sin nature working with our conscience by the power of the flesh to create nothing but dead works. In fact, it appears from scripture that we do not even have any faith on our own. Granted, we believe the gospel, but then Christ's faith comes by our hearing or believing that gospel, Romans 10 verse 17. We have already learned that we are justified by Christ's faith and we live by the faith of the Son of God. Romans 1 17, 3 11, and Hebrews 10 verse 38 all say that the just shall live by faith, but this is a quote of Habakkuk 2 verse 4, which says that the just shall live by his faith, which, in light of Galatians 2 verse 20, is the faith of the Son of God. Also, Ephesians 2 verses 8 to 9 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Most everyone says that the gift of God, in these verses, is salvation. However, that immediately follows faith and is also said in opposition to works. Therefore, grammatically speaking, the gift of God, in Ephesians 2 verses 8 to 9, is the faith of Christ, not salvation. Churchianity will never admit this because it takes man even further out of the equation. Also, note that the next verse, Ephesians 2 verse 10, says that we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Note that we walk in the good works, we do not do them ourselves. This is because the faith of Christ does the work through us, it is not us doing God's works in the energies of our flesh. Therefore, when God saves us, rather than equipping us to serve Him in our flesh, He kills our flesh, ye are dead, Colossians 3 verse 3, makes our soul and spirit alive in Christ, and gives us the faith of Christ whereby Christ can live in us. Thus, God's word teaches us the opposite, regarding our life after salvation, of what churchianity teaches. Christ, is our life. Colossians 3 verse 4. The in Christ life is further seen by comparing believing Israel before the cross with believers in the dispensation of grace, as the following chart shows. Grace Dispensation Believers. Let no man judge you by Sabbath. Colossians 2 verse 16. Pray yourself, Rom, 1212, pray wherever, Ida, 310, pray all the time, Ida, 517, Christ the One, sacrifice, Rom, 610. Bodies are living, sacrifices, Rom, 12, colon 1, eat what you want, I Tim, 4, colon 4, we are already holy, 
Colossians 3 verse 12, we always triumph, 2 core, 2 14, simplicity, 2 core, 11 colon 3. All blessings based upon Christ alone, F. 1 colon 3, behold God with open face, 2 core, 2 101. OT believers remember Sabbath, XO. 20 colon 8, Moses prayed for the people, number. 21 colon 7, pray toward the temple, I can. 8.30, Prayer Hour, Act. 3, 1, Animal Sacrifice for Sin Over and Over, Leviticus. 16. Sacrifice 4, Fellowship, Leviticus. 2, Eat Only Certain Foods, Leviticus. 11, Holy Feast Days, Leviticus. 23, 2, Sin Brings Defeat, Joss. 7, 1-5, Complexity, Leviticus, Blessings, Slash Cursings, Based Upon Performance, Do. 27 to 28. Killed for looking at God, XO. 1921, Righteousness, do. 4, 8. Since we are now in Christ, every day is holy unto the Lord. Therefore, we can pray without ceasing, eat whatever we want, present our bodies as living sacrifices to God, do no wrong, are always blessed, can look at God in His Word, and can live godly lives. By contrast, Israel, before the cross, could do none of these things. All Israel had was a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ, Colossians 2 verse 17.